Hello, and welcome to Motor World. Our show this week is full of action, including dirt tracking, speedway, road racing, and much more. The longer I talk, the less you'll see, so let's get to it. First up, the AMA National Championship Motocross Series Finale. To win the 500 title for the second straight year, Rick Johnson needed a first moto win or two decent moto finishes. In the early going of moto number one, the two decent moto finishes must have looked good to the Team Honda rider. Jeff Ward, number two, not in contention for the title, was the early leader, followed by Kawasaki teammate and title challenger, Ron Lachine, number four. Then it was Lachine's turn to lead and Ward's turn to duke it out with Johnson. RJ got in a pretty good lick, but score that round for Ward. When the front-running trio reappeared, Lachine was still in front, but second had become the property of Johnson. By the 20-minute mark of the 30-minute moto, Lachine had opened a huge lead, but Johnson was set to go to work. The title was on the line, and Johnson quickly closed the gap. Then on the 70-mile-per-hour downhill, the defending champ went 75. The El Cajon California rider needed only to keep his Honda upright, and the title would be his. At the finish line, Johnson, with a healthy margin over second-place Lachine, coasted to the win. Touchdown! Johnson's championship total now stands at seven. Only Bob Hanna and Brock Glover are close to that number. They each have six. Thank God it's over. Uh, now I don't have to do anything in the second race, but go out and have a good time, and it feels good to wrap it up with one race to go. The second moto was all Jeff Ward's. Early in the season, Ward, a co-favorite to win the title, recorded a DNF. For the rest of the season, Ward played team tactics, often sacrificing his upfront position to further his teammates' cause. But when Johnson wrapped up the title, the gloves came off. Lachine chased Ward in the early going, but was not able to maintain the torrid pace set by Ward, who wrapped up his second overall win of the 500 season. As we wrap up the chase for the 500 crown, watch Doug Dubach and Johnson. Dubach salutes the champ. That was the last lap of the last 500 moto. The season was not over, though. There were still scores to settle in the most competitive class of the year. Let's return to Washougal for the wrap-up of the six-month-long 125 season. George Holland, rider number three, wrapped up the 125 championship prior to the Washougal event. Up for grabs, though, was second place in the series. Guy Cooper, number five, needed to make up seven points on number 16, Suzuki's Donnie Schmidt. In the first moto, the Team Honda rider did just that. Cooper took over first when early moto leader Holland miscued and proceeded to run away from the rest of the field. Holland recovered to eventually finish second, while the best Schmidt could do was fourth. Going into the final moto of the 1988-125 season, the two riders were dead even in points. It was all over, however, in corner number one. No, that's not Cooper or Schmidt on the ground. That's pro newcomer Damon Bradshaw. Cooper, however, slowed to avoid the carnage while Schmidt got away clean. When the moto was over, Schmidt had finished second to Cooper's third, giving the team Suzuki rider second place in the standings. The moto win and the overall win for the day fell to recently crowned 125 national champ, Team Honda's George Holland. It was Holland's first national title and one the Kerman, California native will savor for years to come. Team Suzuki presents the Moto World Suzuki Event Calendar. A look at some of the major events coming up in the world of motorcycles and ATVs. In international road racing, the 500cc World Championship season comes to a conclusion at the Brazilian Grand Prix on September 17th. October 2nd signals the end of the American road racing season. Sears Point Raceway is the site for the Superbike Showdown between Bubba Schobert and Doug Poland. Amateur road racing's biggest gathering takes place on November 5th and 6th at Road Atlanta. The Suzuki National Cup finale will be headline act. Also on the program, the Wira Grand National Finals. Still to come on Motor World, a visit north of the border to the 6th Annual Sport Bike Rally. The world comes to California for a Speedway Showdown. And coming up next, high-speed, mild dirt track racing. We'll be right back. A National Dirt Track Championship. Bubba Schobert, on the other hand, has captured the title three years in a row. At the end of this year, however, those two riders might find their customary positions have switched. Here's Chris Larson with the last two dirt track events. The results speak for themselves. The traditional Indy Mile doubleheader is staged at the state fairgrounds where entertainment is the name of the game. Unfortunately for dirt trackers and folks attending the fair, Mother Nature was not cooperating. Saturday night's Camel Pro event was canceled. The next morning, the rain stopped, but the track needed some repairs. 
The decision came down to cancel the scheduled race on Sunday and replace it with the Camel Pro race canceled the previous night. The Indy doubleheader was transformed into a single day game that started at dusk. It was clear from early on that the race would be between the Mile King Bubba Schobert on the number one Honda and number 11 Scott Parker on the Harley. The two rivals went at it hammer and tong, lap after lap. In the end, Parker nipped Schobert at the line. Here's another look at the finish from a different angle. Schobert was consoled by clinching his fourth straight Camel Pro Championship. Afterwards, Scott Parker's mom, among others, greeted the Harley rider who maintained a slim advantage over Schobert in the Grand National Dirt Track standing. The next round in Springfield, Illinois, took place under threatening skies, but Mother Nature held back until the National was run. Again, the favorites, the awesome number one Honda tuned by Skip Aiken and ridden by Bubba Schobert versus the Bill Werner tuned Harley of Scott Parker. In the early going, Schobert held the point with number 44, Alex Jorgensen, and number 31, Dan Ingram, holding pace. Ingram is an interesting story. He's sponsored by none other than Bubba Schobert, and his bike was displaying the benefits of the arrangement. Indy Mile winner Scott Parker not only joined the party, but took over the festivities. The Harley broke away from the lead trap and was gone. Schobert had to fend off his sponsored rider Ingram, who in turn bit the hand that feeds him and beat the dirt track champion to the finish line. Parker, meanwhile, was basking in glory. There's no holding back when the Michigan native takes the checker. His greeting party was also on the exuberant side. For back-to-back -back wins on the mile, Scott Parker is our Castrol Rider of the Week. The Grand National Points Leader will receive a custom jacket and plaque for being named Castrol Rider of the Week. After the Champagne Wars, Parker reflected on what it would take to dethrone the king of the dirt tracks, Bubba Schobert. Just go out there and put in 100% like we've been doing week in and week out, and uh, hopefully we can beat him uh, 16 points uh, up. Uh, hey, just put in 100%, and I think we can do it. Reporting for Motor World, this is Chris Larson. Sport bike owners usually gather at a road race or some canyon road for camaraderie. Rallies, for the most part, are for the touring crowd. This week's Coors Behind the Scenes segment looks at a rally specifically for those who fantasize about Mike Halewood or Kenny Roberts when they go riding. Steve Saunders has the story. It's acknowledged as the biggest single-day motorcycle rally in North America. Sport Bike 88, alias the 6th Annual European and Cafe Motorcycle Rally, attracts thousands for a day of camaraderie with fellow sport bike enthusiasts. In addition to the rally, the riders are treated to one of Canada's premier summer resorts. The 30,000 Island Resort area in Ontario serves as a picturesque background for the collectors of high-performance machinery. We've got everything from $22,000 handcrafted American motorcycles, the Buell RR100, to a, uh, a bemoted DB1RS, a handcrafted jewel of an Italian bike, to very, very common, simple street bikes you could uh, find at your local dealership any day of the week. The main thing is that everybody enjoys riding their bikes, and, and they'll ride them from all over the place. We have people here today from Florida and Georgia. I haven't counted the states yet. We've got people here from over 30 states today. Unlike the majority of rallies, the unique aspect of Sport Bike 88 is the fact that all the motorcycles are sport machines. No dual purpose or full dressers at this party. The bikes range from showroom Japanese rocket ships to restored beauties like this 1955 Nimbus. One of the few bikes built in Denmark, the Nimbus features shaft drive and external valve action, a very rare motorcycle indeed. Late in the day, awards are given out for various classes and categories of exhibiting. Organizer Mike Maloney received his own award in the form of a t-shirt with the inscription, Brilliant Leader. The day ends the way it began, on the road. Nicknamed the Thunder Ride, this year's participants numbered well over 400. A quick spin around the Perry Sound area unleashes all that built-up enthusiasm before the long haul back home. Next year will be the seventh annual rally, and I'm sure organizer Mike Maloney and company will have a high percentage of return business. Reporting for Moto World, this is Steve Saunders. When we return, we'll have the ultimate sport bikes in action as we head to Europe for 500cc World Championship Racing. Stay tuned to the Nashville Network. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to Moto World. Dennis Torres has joined us for an update on the World Championship road race scene. Dennis, I understand that Eddie Lawson has taken a rather significant step toward clinching the world title. Larry, they say it's not over till it's over. Between you and I, it's over. With the cancellation of the Argentine Grand Prix, the Swedish Grand Prix essentially would decide the championship. 
Eddie Lawson and defending world champ Wayne Gardner went to the Scandinavian country, each in control of their own destiny. In the early going of the 30-lap affair, neither Gardner nor Lawson were out front. Instead, number 17 British GP winner Wayne Rainey held down the points. But watch Lawson all of a sudden swing out to the inside and, in one fell swoop, overtake three riders to put himself into second place. Again in slow motion, Lawson and Christian Sara on the blue bike almost collide. Lawson goes to the inside and starts to cut a tighter arc. On his left shoulder, Wayne Gardner and Didier Duradi, neither of which can stop Lawson from blasting through to take second. Picasso couldn't have painted it any better. Lawson was still in an overtaking mood after that pass and on the next lap took the lead with this pass of fellow Californian Wayne Rainey. Back in third, Gardner saw his championship disappearing along with the tail end of Lawson's Yamaha. It took him a few laps to get by Rainey, and when he finally did, Lawson was long gone. To make matters worse for the defending champ, Rainey and Sarah, number seven, were not about to roll over and play dead. They repassed Gardner and added yet another roadblock between Gardner and the fast disappearing Lawson. Gardner eventually rode away from Rainey and Saron and ended up a distant second. The battle for third then became the focus of attention as Saron, number five, Neil McKenzie, and Rainey went at it for the second half of the race. In the end, it was Saron on the blue Yamaha who came out on top. As Gardner rode helplessly in second, he must have been thinking about all those off-season distractions as a result of his world championship. All those public appearances that took the place of testing and resting up for the grueling schedule. Lawson, meanwhile, put himself through a rigorous off-season training program and was tunneled vision towards success. His win in Sweden virtually assures him of his third world championship. Gardner has been very vocal in downplaying Eddie Lawson's performance this year. Scoring points in every race with six wins in 13 races sounds like championship statistics to me. And to me, so why has Gardner been so rough on Lawson? One, I think it's Gardner's nature. Two, he has complained that Lawson has had the better equipment all year. To that I say, sorting the bike out is part of the job of being a racer. If Gardner wants to be considered one of the greats, then he must learn to ride to compensate for the bike's shortcomings, the way Mike Halewood, Kenny Roberts, and Freddie Spencer have done before him. I think Gardner has learned to win the title is one thing, to defend it is another. I'd buy that 100%. Thank you very much, Dennis. Let's look back at the last time Eddie Lawson won the World Championship. This week's Bram Auto Life flashback recalls the 86 Grand Prix season. Dave Bowman reports. In 1985, Freddie Spencer accomplished an unprecedented feat in Grand Prix road racing. The Honda factory star won both the 250 and 500cc World Championship titles. The message was clear to his rivals. Hard work was needed. Our 1986 would be a Spencer Honda Encore. Team Yamaha's Eddie Lawson, a former 500cc world champion, took up the challenge. Lawson, number two, quickly established himself as the dominant rider in the 500cc title chase. Just as important to the Yamaha factory was the fact that Lawson was being joined on victory celebrations by his fellow Yamaha mounted riders. In Sweden, the penultimate round of the series, Lawson left little doubt who would be wearing the championship crown. A convincing victory assured Lawson and Yamaha of the most prestigious motorcycle championship in the world. In the 250cc ranks, Carlos Lovato of Venezuela was Yamaha's standard bearer. The stylish rider who held the quarter leader title in 1983 set the tone for his championship season in the first race of the year. Like Lawson, Lovato's title clinching round also came in the next to the last series round. The South American rider led the race early before having a mid-race fight with his rivals. At the finish, it was Lovato and Yamaha, the 250cc World Championship victors. Yamaha's hard work had paid off in a sweep of the sports two premier classes. Reporting for Motor World, this is Dave Bowman. This week's Roll Aids Rough Ride of the Week belongs to this Japanese road racer. After that, he definitely needed that 100% Roll Aids relief. Welcome back. Next up, the first annual Team Speedway WrestleMania Quad Racer Shootout Mini Car Bump and Run. At least, that's what I would have called it. Actually, it was the third annual American Cup Speedway Challenge. No matter the name, it could only happen in Southern California. Here's Mark McKay. 
The American Cup Speedway Challenge pits a team of American riders against the rest of the world in team match competition. Only four laps long, the races are fast and exciting. The winner gets three points, second place two points, and third one. Fourth gets a big fat zero. The American Cup goes to the team accumulating the most points. For the past two years, the Cup has remained in the United States. From the onset of this year's event, it was obvious Team World in green jerseys and helmets were tired of losing. Here, American team captain Sam Ermolenko gates first, but has shown no respect. England's Jeremy Doncaster with the inside line squeezes Ermolenko to the outside, where Italian champ Armando Castigna finishes the job by bumping Ermolenko to fourth. That bump, though, only served to get sudden Sam's juices flowing. The California native finished third in that heat and went on to top all scorers with five outright wins. Speedway, though, was just part of the action. In a quad shootout, Brian Fry, number five, provided the excitement with this first quarter crash. In the main event, with Andrew Buck in the lead, it was up to number 40, Brian Sanders, to liven things up, and he did just that. Then a couple of disc jockeys took to the track. It's obvious they were inspired by the evening's excitement. But hold on, you ain't seen nothing yet. In a classic grunt and groan tag team match, it was America, the good guys, against the bad guys. A couple of Bolsheviks from Russia with love. That one was settled outside the ring with you-know-who coming out on top. And how about the special attraction? It was billed as the ultimate match race. Two-time American World Speedway champion Bruce Penhall against former world champ New Zealand's Ivan Major. Penhall kept the American win string intact, and so did the American team. For the third straight year, the American Cup will remain in the good old USFA. For Motor World, I'm Mark McKay. Like I said, it could only happen in Southern California. And with that, we're out of time. Stay with us all for a special message and some more Speedway fun stuff. Fun, that is, if you like bikini contests. Until next time, keep your wheels on the ground and your feet on the pegs. For all of us here at Motor World, I'm Larry Myers.